Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Cade, welcoming IO Till It Right. New book out, Darling Days. Check it out. Hey everyone, it's me, Arthur Cade. All right, Ayo, so congratulations. You are a published author. How cool does that sound? It's crazy. Today is a weird day. It's not a weird day. It's an exciting day. It's extremely exciting and extremely weird. I'm 31. I mean, it's like, it's weird. And you get a memoir. That's like insane to me. It's weird. I have seven years on you. I should be on my second memoir (laughs) right now. Like, Harper Collins, give me a memoir. All right, so congrats. This whole thing got born out of a TED Talk, essentially. So walk me through the process. How does... The TED Talk become Darling Day. Uh, the TED Talk, uh, basically, <laughs> well, you do a TED Talk, and then weird things start to happen, and people start calling and asking you to do things that you have no familiarity with. So I called a friend who I knew worked at an agency that represented speakers, and I was like, hey, will you connect me to the speaking division? And he was like, yes, but have you thought about writing a book? And I was like, yeah, when I was 50. And he was like, well, think about it now. Sit down and start writing. And he didn't know that writing was how I most naturally expressed myself, and uh, he didn't know that I had this insane life. And um, I sent him a page. I wrote the first Baby Girl's Gun, which is like the very opening chapter of the book. It's one page. And he was like, oh, you're a writer. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. And he turned out to be this incredible um, Asian and friend and human being. And he, uh, eight months later, got me a book deal. Okay. I- I knew some of your life before this, but then getting into the book and getting into just the whole story blew my mind. Mm. For those who don't know your life, mm. give me the, the give, pretty much tell me the whole book right now. Like, <laughs> what are people going to find out? How when much they time do we have? You got as much as you want. You know, a lot of people I think want to um, attach themselves to the gender thing about my story. You know, I lived as a boy for eight years when I was a kid. I identify as a trans man now. Sure, okay, and. There's, the heart of the book is really about my relationship with my mother and my relationship with myself and my mom um, is a performance artist and a poet and a showgirl and a real New York original. Like my mom still lives downtown and walks around talking about the yuppies and you know, like my mom is like the real, real, real deal. And um, we grew up super, super poor on a block that the Bowery Hotel is now on, you know, in a different time when we lived in low-income housing and my mom um, struggled with some addiction stuff and some mental things and I was a child actor and it was like the 80s and 90s in New York so it was like the height of AIDS and art and punk and all other no-wave weirdo music and everyone around us was self-invented characters and Nan Golden's photos, like this like high art and like low, low addiction and sickness, and then a baby in the middle. <laughs> and that baby was me. So it's like, you know, if you drop the cheetah out of a helicopter, it's going to take off running, and that was basically my life. So, yeah, those are the headlines, you know. New York, East Village, poverty, improvisation, some gender stuff, drugs, art. Book. Figure it out. Book. Book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right now, obviously, it's such a hot topic. We're dealing with an incredible period where there's such a battle now for LGBT rights, mm. marriage equality, transgender rights. When you look around right now, we're seeing actors and actresses, everyone from Laverne Cox mm. to Jeffrey Tambor to so many who are making positive statements right now. What are your thoughts on what's going on? Oh, it's incredible. I think the visibility. I think that my basic philosophy is that familiarity begets empathy. When you get to know somebody, you come to care about somebody and stop seeing them as a stereotype and stop seeing them as something that can be mythologized and then feared and dismissed. If we know that fear is the root of discrimination, then really visibility is the key to breaking down discrimination. So I think the more homes transgender people enter into, the more homes Uh, Ellen crawls through the television into the more people who are like, I don't know what you are. Oh, but I've seen that other person who represents that. You know, I was on a TV show on MTV and and people come up to me in Walmart in the middle of nowhere and they're like, hey, I love this thing that you said. And they're not thinking about the fact that I'm transgender. They're thinking about the fact that they like something I said. And then later that's a reference point for them. Oh, 
I know a transgender person. And that makes it OK. And that makes it safe, because I know they're a nice person. And they're not trying to, like, I don't know, molest my children or whatever they think that we're trying to do, you know? So I think familiarity and all the visibility is incredibly key. And I'm so grateful to be alive during this time where I'm not going to get, you know, I'm, it's still illegal to just be me in 70 countries on it's the insane. planet, you know? What was it like as a kid? You were going through so much of this identity. I don't think crisis is the right word, but I, I did. I, I, it was identity, uh, finding out who you were, discovering who you are, and showing the world and going through different phases. What was it like as a child in the Lower East Side at that time? Every kid goes through an identity crisis. It's true. Every kid struggles to figure out who they are. No matter who you are, no matter I think how I'm still normal I'm you are. St I think I'm still struggling. Yeah, <laughs> everybody does. And no matter what category or bracket you fall into, everybody's just trying to figure out how to be comfortable with themselves. It just so happened that the things that I felt comfortable in, very, very, very few other people felt comfortable in or expressed that out loud. So it was a very isolating experience to grow up the way that I did. Um, it, you know, my mom and I didn't have a house. We didn't have electricity a lot of the times, and there wasn't a lot of food around. So there would, weren't the opportunities for socializing or an environment for socializing that were maybe available to other kids. We'd have play dates or have people over to their house without their parents being like, whoa, that's a crazy house. Um, so I spent a lot of time alone, and I spent a lot of time wandering around New York City, which on the one hand is very... Like, you know, but on the other hand, is is gave me exposure to every different type Grows of human you up. being. Grows you up quickly. It's New Yorkers, you know, Native Grows New York kids, up. we do it all way too early, which you can read about in the book <laughs> if you want to. Um, but New York in the 80s and 90s is the foundation of who I am because it's this foundational notion that there are every different type of human being in a very enclosed environment. You know, Manhattan's only so wide, so we're all right there, and it, it gave me this kind of sense that everyone is actually interesting. Not just equal, but like interesting and worth getting to know and worth talking to the like African guys selling $5 hats on Broadway, you know? <laughs> so that's the world that I came up in, and I also was very fortunate in the sense that my parents weren't oppressive about my gender stuff or my sexuality or any way that I expressed myself. My parents were like, cool, you know, great, yes, we back this, you know. So I'm, I'm very, very fortunate on that front and not so fortunate on other kind of basic provisions fronts. But like, that's all relative, you know. My, me not having electricity on a Tuesday is just as damaging to me as, you know, somebody's mom not bringing them hot chocolate after their soccer practice on a Friday. It's like, Everybody has their, I don't see myself as a victim. When you look at what's going on right now, you and I were just talking about the election. Mm. It, this is crazy, and you were live tweeting it last night. What are your thoughts on oh. what you see going on politically Hashtag right now? Hashtag semi-exact. <laughs> that was the best. That was the best. Um, it's terrifying to me. It's not something that we haven't seen before throughout history around the world. Um, you can galvanize and mobilize people using fear. That is an age-old human mobilization tactic. And it, it's scary to me that people haven't learned from history and we haven't seen what can happen when you operate. You make your political choices based on base instincts of fear and not uh, who is actually qualified or who is actually educated or who really knows how to do their job. But when you operate, mobilized by fear tactics, it suddenly becomes important that all of these things that this guy is saying on television have no factual basis. He is saying that stop and frisk reduced crime. No, actually, stop and frisk was, was, was unconstitutional, ruled unconstitutional, and violent crime went down after stop and frisk went away. And also, the guy is sitting there being asked about how to repair relations between black people and white people, or the rift with black culture, and he's talking about how stop and frisk is a good thing. Stop and frisk single-handedly put how many thousands of African-American and Latino people in prison unjustifiably and started legacies of families that can't get a job because they have a criminal record. And that's what this guy is talking about, about how to repair race relations? What planet is this dude on? Oh, and $650 million really isn't that much. I have friends that tell me it's not that much money. Uh -huh, yeah, you're real relatable, bro. Like, good luck with the American people. Oh, my God. So you're with her. <laughs> I, look, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm with Bernie, but I'm going to say this. I think that anybody who opts out of voting, it's criminal to opt out of voting at this point. Because if you don't understand that opting out of voting because you support somebody else more than you support Hillary Clinton, if you don't recognize that you are going to cost this country, specifically me, you are going to cost me my ability to live in my body safely, it, it's, it's ignorant. It's ignorant. You, you have to vote. And unfortunately, we live in a system that forces us sometimes to pick the lesser of two evils. And I don't think Hillary Clinton is necessarily evil. She's not my top choice. But this is the system that we live in. And we have two choices. And not voting, it's like when something awful is going on, inaction is an action. So something awful is on the precipice of happening. And if you don't take some action, you are going to be party to the fascist fallout that f follows. You do so much. You're an artist. You're now a writer. I mean, there's so much going on. What's your favorite? What's your favorite activity of them all? Like, where do you express I yourself? Yeah, you know, that's. <laughs> but I mean, you express yourself in so many different ways. It, it really is inspiring. Thank you. How do you use your art? You know, when when you look at your art, is it something where it's like, hey, I want a message behind this. Um, I'm going to use it for this, or is yeah. it just? So yeah. everything you do is to, to, to communicate. Every single thing that I do has uh, the same through line, which is creating familiarity, to create empathy, to reduce discrimination. And I think that human stories are the most powerful tool to that. So naturally, my own story has to come first. If I'm going to tell anybody's story and air anybody's dirty laundry, it's got to be mine first. And unfortunately for my parents, sorry, <laughs> mom and dad, them too. Um, but, uh, yeah, the through line, you know, the MTV show that I did was all about helping people be honest about who they were and realizing that hiding in shame around their truth was costing them, was costing their relationships, was costing their friendships, um, and that lying is never the solution. And it just, it, it's like insidious. It eats at you when you hide who you are. So... That was what that was about. The book is about, you know, sure, get to know a person who identifies as transgender, but that's not the point. The real point is take another look at what you give to your kids. Take another look at, yes, the Lexus might be great, and, like, Harvard might be awesome, but, like, all that can go away. But the thing that cannot go away is the sense of dignity and self-respect that you give them by respecting who they tell you that they are. And that's not about being LGBT. It's not about any specific silo of identity. It's just about the very base idea that as human beings, we have to respect who people say that they are because it gives them the strength to survive a really gnarly world that's trying to tell them who they are every day. So yeah, that's the through line that runs through everything that I do. All my photography work, uh, I've been, I spent the last six years photographing 10,000 people who are anywhere on the LGBT spectrum and I'm going to take them to the National Mall. I have 9,803 portraits in 50 states. I'm glad oh you God. recognize how insane that is. That is ins it's it's insane. insane. I can't even begin to imagine. It's, I'm like turning into Chuck Close. I have no facial recognition anymore. I think I know everyone. It's <laughs> terrible. Or that I don't know everyone I should know. It's a mess. Sorry in <laughs> advance. But uh, yeah, I'm going to go to the National Mall with that. But again, even that project, the point of that is... Look at all of these people who identify as this one thing. Every single one of them identifies as something else, too. There is no single story. There is no single identity. There is a multiplicity of identity in every single one of us. You're 5,000 things. I'm 5,000 things. Stop defining people by one thing. Yeah, okay, you're black, but you're also a fireman, and you're also a dad, and you're also, a, you know, all these other things that you might identify with more strongly that's exciting then life becomes like rich you know human interaction becomes exciting that's perfect congrats that's why you got a book <laughs>